Have you ever felt like a fish out of water? I never have, because I don't know what it's like to be a fish. Academic language, how it can be a very exclusive, you know, where does it reach, right? Can it go out of this ivory tower? How do you speak as an academic? Even in the same language, we can create barriers. In my perspective, it's very sad that sometimes uh, some languages become a language of uh, colonizers and you have a kind of uh, hate and love uh, connection with them. Literature alone cannot uh, do the job we wanted to do. And I hope that people, when they judge a work, that they will judge it for its literary value too, and not let their own political views just decide for that they like or dislike this work. Novels can help us also to slow down our pace and really stay also with a text and an author and a story uh, before scrolling to the next one. Welcome to Standard Time, a Eurozine production. This is a talk show with guests from all over Europe and the world, bringing you discussions that go beyond Europe's very fortified borders. I'm Reka Kingapop, editor-in-chief of said Eurozine, the magazine presenting this show, and Eurozine is also a co-founder of the Display Europe platform. I'm also a migrant worker, yammering in English to an international audience from Austria about the sorry state of my home country, Hungary. So whether you're watching us from your ancestral land or in diaspora, since this is a digital production, you get to watch it on your own time, your respective standard time. I say watch it, but we also publish our episodes in a podcast format, and you can find them both on displayeurope.eu or just look for Standard Time Talk Show on any podcast app or your usual video platforms. But also come over and check our content sharing platform, Display Europe. We have a star-studded episode to close our first season with today. And worry not, we'll be back in September with a whole new season with new topics, some of them suggested by you, our viewers. Human history is a history of migration, and people continue to be on the move due to a myriad of circumstances. Most of them aren't merely looking for adventure or doing a fun gap year, but are trying to escape political persecution, climate catastrophes, and, well, war and genocide. Displacement is a bitter amuse, but a very powerful one. The experience of exile has played a huge role for thousands of years in literary history, making way for the likes of Hannah Arendt and Edward Said, to mention only a few authors who have contributed to the exilic literature. The sorrowful voice of those who had been forced out of their homes have inspired theories surrounding language, identity, and memory. Should an exile write only with their mother tongue, or in adoptive languages, or maybe rather the reigning lingua franca? How can a writer translate disembodied experiences? And where does the literature produced in exile belong to? 20th century European culture was defined by the epoch of exil literature, from authors fleeing Nazi rule to emigre writers escaping the Soviet Union, and in the writings of stateless refugees who still to this day struggle for freedom and sovereignty. Because not everybody has the luxury to cry over a home country. At least 10 million people are stateless today, and over 108 million are forcibly displaced, according to the UNHCR. The reasons for statelessness vary, but international law is organized around nation states rather than universal human rights. Stateless people have it particularly difficult when it comes to accessing health care, education, employment, and the freedom of movement, and that's just scratching the surface. Though the simple definition of statelessness refers to people who do not hold a nationality, the condition of it goes beyond mere legal documents or recognition. Diasporas such as the Palestinian, the Kurdish, the Roma or Rohingya ones are considered to belong to nations without a state, and many of them have long embraced the condition of statelessness in their work, even if some are holding citizenships from other countries. Now that we have established the importance and potential of this form of literature, let's contend with some biting questions. How much influence, platform and space do writers have today as readership plummets and gives way to more superficial media? Is it always their job to represent their people, their cause? Can an exile write about anything else other than the exile? Well, I guess they can write, but can they publish? Do we appreciate and lift up those works that don't fit the mold? 
Our guests today are here to tell us about disappearance, alternative narratives, and who they are writing for. Beirouz Bouchani is an award-winning Kurdish writer, journalist, cultural advocate, and filmmaker. His memoir, No Friends But the Mountains, was written during his six years of incarceration by the Australian government in Papua New Guinea's Manus Island prison, tabbed out and sent as single messages in Persian over the years. Ibsam Azam is a Palestinian novelist, short story writer, and journalist based in New York. She was born and raised in Taibeh near Jaffa. She works as a senior correspondent covering New York and the UN for Al Arabi Ajadid newspaper. She has published two novels in Arabic. Her second novel, The Book of Disappearance, was translated into English, Italian, and German. Bia Ginayata is a professor of Southeastern European Studies at the University of Graz in Austria and is leading the project Elastic Borders, Rethinking the Borders of the 21st Century. Her research focuses on migration, borders, citizenship and post-colonial studies. Maybe we could start with something that you authors and, and researchers share the language that you use in your work. If some, how do you decide which language to use in which context? You're both a literary author and a journalist, so and you write across languages. Um, la well, language is a very tricky. As you know, I am a Palestinian. Grew up, I was born and grew up there, um, and then later and lived in Jerusalem for a while, and then later lived in Europe before moving to the U.S. When I write literature, let's say. I chose to write in Arabic. It's the language that I feel the most, I, I feel comfortable to write with. I write sometimes in English, but they have a different approach. I, For me, it's very difficult to um, imagine writing fiction uh, in any other language than Arabic. It's a very beautiful language that I really love. And for me, if I would write in a different uh, language than Arabic, the same story, the same characters, I probably will write them differently. With using Arabic, you are part of a very, very long literary tradition as well. Um, Behtouz, what is your relationship? You exist a, between a lot of languages, right? And you have always existed between a lot of languages. And you have now been translated to some very obscure languages, quite like my mother tongue, Hungarian. <laughs> I think my uh, relation with the language is very challenging all the time because uh, I born as a Kurd, my mother uh, tongue is Kurdish and uh, I learned Farsi later but I didn't have to talk with it until I became like 18 years old that I moved to a Persian city and I started to speak with that language more often. In Iranian side we have a huge problem because the only formal language is Farsi. Everything is a public language. But Kurdish language is just a, a language for home uh, on the street. And when that happened for a language, actually, that means beginning of killing that language. That is uh, our huge problem and challenge. You know, the books that I've published, they are written in Farsi, but now I am more writing with my ma mother language. I should mention about English as well, that English for me is a language that I can uh, rely on, I can escape to. Hopefully that one day I write in uh, English as well. In my perspective, it's very sad that sometimes uh, some languages become a language of uh, colonizers and you have a kind of uh, hate and love uh, connection with them. Because, you know, Farsi is a language of power for us and is a language that actually dominates our language. Bian, you also work across a lot of languages and you work with people from very, very different backgrounds. So I have an in international and interdisciplinary team. I'm directing um, this research project called Elastic Borders, where um, we are a rethinking um, about contemporary borders of the 21st century. We are focusing very much on the European border regime. And we have case studies um, in Tunisia, at the Tunisian-Libyan border, on the Greek islands, uh, especially in Samos, as well as in 
Tenerife and the Canary Islands. There are many languages there because of the persons on the move. I haven't counted how many languages are spoken, but it would be Greek, Italian, dialects of Arabic, Spanish, German, French. We have also Ukrainian scholar, we have Turkish Kurdish. So we, I think eight maybe, right? And the researcher who works at the Tunisian uh, Libyan border, when she was transcribing an interview, we use also the new software to assist. It cannot do that because in Tunisia, when you do a, uh, an interview, people will use French, Arabic, maybe say an English term, and that confuses the software. If you bring in from different geographies languages, uh, it's too much at this moment, right? And this monolingualism that we still right, see uh, in the softwares is something part of a nation state system where monolingualism has been enforced, right? I mean, the multiplicity of plurality of languages is due to the fact that we are heterogeneous societies. Um, for instance, I mean, I was born and raised in Germany. My parents migrated from Turkey. They belong to a minority within the minority. They're Kurdish, but they speak. They're Zazaki. It's an endangered language. Even I don't speak it. Beshruz and I speak converse in English, and I found this oh, to be wow. extremely awkward, right? We, we talked about this. What applies to language as a space of exclusion and inclusion is also, of course, for academic research, not just with different languages. I think also always a lot about academic language, how it can be a very exclusive, you know, where does it reach, right? Can it go out of this ivory tower? How do you speak as an academic? Even in the same language, we can create barriers. If the readers are interested in Birgins and, and her colleagues' work, check out Elastic Borders, the focal point in Eurozine, on topics that you have already mentioned, and hopefully more coming up. Um, my research deals with the increasing militarization and um, uh, fortification of borders and their impacts that they have in these very different localities. Communicating this you know, to a broader uh, audience was very important, so it was fantastic that we had this collaboration. How do you feel about the terminology of the exile? Do you identify with it? Do you find it problematic? Are you, are you comfortable with this? Or is there another expression that you would use for yourself? I cover in my work as a journalist a lot of politics and I report about the UN. And what is striking, especially in these times, for example, if we take Palestine as an example and what's happening in Gaza, it is very often in the media uh, when the language that it used to describe the killing and the massacres against Palestinians, it is very often put in a passive form. We don't see active sentences saying who killed them. This doesn't happen uh, just by accident. There is a reason why we don't see that. The Palestinian case is an example, but you can also uh, say that about other uh, minorities or non-minorities. Now to exile, for me as a Palestinian, as you know, probably uh, a large majority of Palestinians, um, more than the half, they are not allowed until today the right of return by Israel. Uh, they cannot go back to their homeland. When I left more than 20 years ago and went to Europe, it, I never had the intention to stay as long as I stayed now. <laughs> I always wanted to go back. I still have family there. I go every year. I just was there in March. Although when I lived in Germany and now in the US, I do um, make sure to adapt to languages, to cultures, etc. I do agree that probably through studying and getting in touch and contact with other cultures, uh, it did influence my writing, but that could have happened also if I was still living in Palestine and reading either uh, in foreign languages or translated literature to Arabic. So all these issues play a role the way we choose uh, the language. If you want to know more about European news and see what the Display Europe portal has to offer, check out Vox Europe's press review articles and short video recaps. A judgment by the European Court of Human Rights could very well change the way people address climate inaction, as Emanuela Barbirolio reveals in her press review. Indeed, the court condemned Switzerland to pay €80,000 to the association elders for climate protection. Four of its members complained about its failings regarding climate protection, as they worry about the impact of heat waves on their well-being, Le Monde explains. So check out displayeurope.eu and subscribe to the newsletter so you keep informed. 
I think exile, at least for in European languages, it is a very charged expression, but it can sometimes feel, especially I think in English, as a very individual thing. I wonder whether maybe maybe exile or diaspora could be an alternative, or how do you feel about this? And uh, many people I know, uh, you know, mostly refugees, have a problem with this kind of concept, like uh, exile. But generally, I myself am comfortable with all of these words, these concepts, but I prefer to use the word diaspora uh, and diaspora literature, and for me, it's not mean that you create a kind of literature that is uh, actually is about the place that you come from. Any write, writer who leave the forced to be leave, leave the place and go to another country, another society, and write. I uh, included in the diaspora literature, even when your story is not about the place that you come from. I think as a migrant or as a refugee, you have a unique perspective towards politics, towards the society that you live, towards the society that is hosting you. And that is a part of your uh, writing. Probably you are not aware of it, but that is a part of it. It's really important, the language about, uh, for example, Palestine that these days we see in the uh, media without the recognition of who is causing these problems. I've written about it quite a lot, about the language, how the media rely on the official uh, languages. And that happened with refugees as well these days, that how they criminalize uh, refugees. Sometimes they victimize refugees. Generally, I think the problem is with all of these concepts, sometimes the doesn't uh, recognize the agency uh, of us as a marginalized people. Birgin, you mentioned that you stopped doing TV debates, and I think it does have to do with the register and the language and how useful they seemed. Can you tell us about this? And also, Thanks for making an exception here. <laughs> the different develop, political developments, uh, we see them manifest and being reproduced in language. I was making that comment with regard to the issues of migration and border, where especially, you know, in Austrian, German or, you know, European context, we see a very uh, normalization of violent expressions and a constant attempt to create another category, another category, another category, and to introduce many, many, many different distinction in order to legitimize certain movements and delegitimize, criminalize other forms of movement. The term irregular migration, right? What, what, what really does that mean? Previous to that was illegal migration even. Berchus uses refugee the whole time, right? And that is also claiming that. A policymaker would now say, oh, is, is asylum seeker, is he a refugee, is he an irregular migrant? So in a way, we are forced in our language um, already to do that what happens at the border, which is filtering and sorting out, and that's very problematic. In my research, I have uh, very strongly criticized also academic um, academics. So we have many categories in the migration literature, and that ca those categories are legal categories because for a person who's displaced, the feeling, the experience of displacement, um, if we would take that as a starting point, we would not make so many different categorizations. We make them because their status changes. Now that matters legally and politically, but for researchers, we don't have to adhere to that, but very often we do so. And yes, I do find TV, uh, many of TV panel discussions to be very polemic. Instead of really engaging with some empirical realities, it is much more about reproducing an ever more escalating perspective. When we actually empirically look at, we're looking at relatively low numbers. The issue that is usually being negotiated in these panel discussions are matters of racism and not of migration. The problem that is being debated there, which is framed as migration, has rarely to do with the phenomenon of migration. It is about particular persons arriving or um, uh, finding it problematic, the presence of particular groups, of racialized groups, 
problematic and it's not a matter of migration. This was one of the times when I was just perpetually upset. The expression of refugee crisis in 2015, 17. Yeah, the instance. refugees were in crisis. The, the countries were not. Right. In those small islands, there was definitely a crisis, right? These are small islands with very minimal infrastructure. They were not, they did not have the infrastructure, right? To appropriately really uh, host and receive them. That there was a humanitarian crisis at that moment, yes, right? But at the large scale, as you say, I mean, that's what I meant about empirical numbers. This discussion that we're witnessing is not a matter of political, infrastructural, economic capacity. It's a matter of will. Europe is in a desperate labor shortage. So Absolutely. basically, if you wanted to solve these problems, we could actually be happy about it. And of course, with the far right becoming more and more dominant across Europe, multiple political parties are talking about uh, deportation routes and establishing basically penal colonies. Practically, that's what they are. That's what you experienced in Manus Island. This is a big draw to people who first pick up your book specifically about this experience. What is something that you would like your readers to know about the books? What does this experience do to your humanity? Uh, actually, in my work, uh, of course, my two books that I published and other works mostly is not only about refugees. That is really important and sometimes people actually reduce uh, these works to a personal story which I am not happy with. You know, it's not a personal story. It's, it's not only about refugees. It's about this link with colonialism context. Uh, as a Kurd that I, uh, you know, come from Kurdistan in that part of the world, as a uh, refugee who been uh, imprisoned in uh, an island by Australian government, that is very obvious for me that the context is a very uh, colonialism context. And also one of the things that I want that people see is uh, that uh, is about other uh, marginalized people as well in the community in the society as well in the book of disappearance you use a very personal tone but it's in a sense it's also a history book a history book that's very tangible and and one can pretty much feel themselves present there and i wonder whether whether you feel that this is a mandate that you have to fulfill and can you fulfill this in, a, in, say, in this publishing environment? I would say um, spontaneously, um, no, I, I don't feel the pressure. But if I'm honest, somewhere there is, of course, a pressure. I, I do, I deal with my creative writing in, um, let's say, two phases. The first phase, I don't think about the readers i don't think what anyone would say i just live in the world of the the i that i create and uh, it is very let's say in the very late stages where i start to consider the outside world just to make things more clearer for readers who are not familiar with the complexity of the palestinian situation and i am aware that the issue of Palestine is very often talked about for wrong reasons, really. For me, uh, I think the fact that I'm writing, all, the, the fact that I have also, let's say, a full-time job um, helps me to take the pressure of having to publish uh, in a big publisher. If translation comes, then it's great, it's wonderful. I did get, for example, an offer from a larger, a bigger um, um, uh, publishing house, but they wanted to make uh, changes. For me, these changes were for political reasons. And I, I said no, and I was um, actually, I didn't think twice about saying no, but no because uh, this is a compromise on the uh, literary in uh, integrity of the book and of my writing. In Eurozine, we take articles from our partner journals and translate them into English. So if there's like a historical background or a cultural reference that's not obvious to uh, an international audience, who do we tailor it to? The international audience doesn't have a geographical space, doesn't even have a normative native language. 
So you either cite or link or explain everything or you don't explain anything. For me, when I read, uh, let's say, um, a literature translated uh, to Arabic from any other language in the world, I look for the different in this uh, um, uh, translation, in, in these cultures. Publishing houses think that uh, their audience, the people they, they deliver to, that they want to uh, have literature that's similar to English. and which doesn't make sense. Writing, for, especially for people who are under minorities or under um, colonialization, is wherever, whenever you write a novel, it, you should be aware of the socioeconomic, class, gender, political situation that the characters are placed in. Whether you mention it or not, that's a totally different issue. And now, a word from today's host, the Asta Foundation's library the Knowledge Hive serving both the research needs of scientific communities and the general public. Come visit them here in the Belvedere neighborhood in Vienna. Thank you, Esther Stiftung Library. You can also become a supporter of the show and you don't even have to emigrate to do so. All I ask is that you pledge your support at patreon.com slash eurozine, that is eurozine, the magazine presenting this program. You can pledge as little as five euros a month or whatever you can afford, and I promise we won't spend it all on library cards. Instead, you'll get access to bonus materials and you even get to submit topics and questions. your focus or your frame of reference is European Union policies. The EU is not Europe, right? Europe is a much bigger unit, but the EU and its policies have a, have a huge global impact, and especially across Africa, Asia, and of course the continent of Europe. I'm a political scientist, so my, I have been always concerned with states. Right? What are the policies of states? Right? And what kind of conflicts and power relations emanate from that? Right? And um, how are state-subject relations being formed when we look at 500 centuries of European colonization, which subjected two-thirds of the world? The issue is not anymore one of the European Union, but of Europe itself. I use, for instance, Behrouz's books in my classes on, um, on migration and displacement. It affects students so deeply, always. It, it helps um, to bring back and remind the reader of humanity, right, in a process of dehumanization. Europe at large, right, um, as part of 500 years of colonization, it, of course, this um, could only work or it rests um, on um, classifications and um, systematic dehumanization. You know, it, I always have to remind that this is less than a century that the uh, United Nations officially declared that race is not useful as a scientific concept. And before that, we have 500 years of subjugating and creating a racial hierarchy of um, people. You know, in less than three decades, it was possible, for instance, in the um, European context, to criminalize and completely dehumanize refugees. That was not the case in 1980 or 1984, for instance. And, and this is really, you could see how in the 1990s, the term bogus asylum seeker was introduced. And then step by step by step, we have seen now, a, you know, stripping off humanity from persons who arrive by boats. And now, especially about regulations and, and legislation newly introduced or forever eroded in the EU, basically what we're arguing about is who are deserving of human rights. And apparently not all humans, which does not compute for my, I'm not very good at maths, but, I'm, but I am good enough at maths to understand that this category should be a bit broader. So I listened to online news, I think it was the German, <laughs> it was uh, Deutschlandfunk, and uh, I heard um, a journalist using the term, um, I will say it in German first and then translate it, Schutzinteressierte, um, to describe asylum seekers, meaning people interested in protection, not in need of protection, but interested. And I was really struck that so we have um, such a intensification of, you know, conflicts, violence and war. And in the context of that, to say people interested in protection, I find that to be a very interesting choice uh, of language that maybe speaks uh, a bit to the question that you asked. 
I think this is a very important um, problem to tackle. And in journalism, there is a certain huge responsibility to how much we conform to language with a malicious political agenda. Absolutely. And this is why I think the arts and, you know, the, the literature is so important, right, to bring back exactly that what is being tried to be erased. The way asylum seekers or immigrants being talked about, um, it's also important to uh, remember what is not being mentioned, because um, a majority, like whether Palestinians, Sudanese, Kurds, you name it, but the, what is left out very often, uh, who is um, helping these, whether occupation, whether oppressive regimes, who's delivering, if we talk about Sudan uh, or Palestine, Gaza, who's delivering weapons? The fact that we don't hear enough about these issues, the fact that we don't, that is not a central uh, subject, uh, the issue of weapon delivery, the issue of protection, etc. It also says um, a lot about how many of these um, media outlets in uh, dominant country, whether US or uh, West European countries, is uh, talked about. <laughs> Let me introduce you to the work of our friend and colleague Claire Potter, a professor emeritus of history at the New School for Social Research and the co-executive editor of Public Seminary, one of Eurozine's partner journals. Her blog, The Political Junkie and podcast Why Now are available to read and listen to on Substack and she's fantastic. Find her under clairepotter.substack.com. Birgin, you say that, that it's so important that literature reinstates or insists or posits the values that political discourse is trying to erase. Is literature able to fulfill this political mandate right now in this publishing environment? Because the readers of this type of literature are diminishing in numbers. So Ipsam, do you think that literature is, is able to fulfill this mandate in this environment? Yes and no, I guess the question. I think it's extremely problematic if we decide that uh, a writer will be th the person who will speak for a whole nation. We have to remember, as in any society, uh, there are, first of all, a lot of different political thinking. Literature alone cannot uh, do the job we want it to do. And I hope that people, when they judge a work, that they will judge it for its war, for its um, literary value too, and not let their own political views just decide for that they like or dislike this work. But Luz, how do you feel about this sort of political agenda? You you also said that you sh you should be allowed to speak of universal things. I think writers are free, and artists are free. But everything doesn't come from art and literature. And there are many other things that uh, create this uh, uh, like, uh, colonial narratives. So I think that is really important. But as a writer or an artist, I think the first thing that we need is to create a good text. So I've been writing about human rights. I say that for me, still, literature should be judged by literature and literature is above everything for me at the is the priority i've been living with these issues that's why i'm able to write about them Birgin, you mentioned that you use literature in your classes which gives a much deeper sort of felt experience for the students do you think that with, with the change in technology and how people actually meet, I mean, literature is a medium, we don't necessarily call it so, but it's a medium. With the change of, of digital media, literature's position is changing? In my previous comment, I was highlighting the potential of literature. Of course, art has to be free and, you know, you know people um, can write about uh, whatever they have, but art has this, you know, literature has indeed this huge potential and capaciousness really to touch and bring something across that, for instance, academic writing cannot do fulfill in that way. There are two reasons why I indeed uh, use um, 
make sure that at least um, one or two novels are part of the reading list. I also do sometimes um, what I call a soundtrack, um, you know, interesting readings, um, novels that could come along, also films, because um, in the very fast paced times in that we live in, I think difficult to sit down and engage for a long time with one particular text. I see this, uh, I'm teaching since more than 20 years and it, you know, the time span, the attention span gets smaller and smaller. It's very important to bring in literature both for the exercise of reading. It's a very complex picture. There are of course many uh, who still read a lot, but the shorter, the better it seems to be the case. <laughs> I was discussing with a um, colleague to do podcasts for on our research and I was thinking about a 20 minute podcast and I was told, no, no, it has to be three minutes that someone listens to what? a short cast. Novels can help us also to slow down our pace and really stay also with a text and an author and a story uh, before scrolling to the next one. Thank you dearly, all, all three of you, for coming on the show and taking the time. And um, I hope to see you all again at some point. The program is presented by Eurozine, an online magazine bringing you reads from more than 100 partner publications and across dozens of European languages. This talk show is a Display Europe production. It's a platform offering you European content on politics, culture, community in 15 languages and from dozens of outlets. You can search and enjoy video, audio and articles across languages with our translation tools and somehow, miraculously, Display Europe also doesn't abuse your user data. I know, it's a shocker. Now, if you like our animations and would want to see more, or just like what you see and wish to support our work, please go to patreon.com slash Eurozine. That is Eurozine, the magazine presenting this show. You can pledge as little as five euros a month or whatever you can afford, and I promise we won't spend them crying over stale croissants with my migrant friends. Instead, you'll get access to bonus materials, early access, and even get to suggest topics and questions. This program is co-funded by the Creative Europe Programme of the European Union and the European Cultural Foundation. Importantly, the views and opinions expressed here are those of the speakers and the authors only and do not necessarily reflect those of the European Union or the European Education and Culture Executive Agency. Neither the European Union nor the EACEA can be held responsible for them. Although, I wouldn't mind if they took advice from us or something. See you in September.